Hello and welcome to today's episode of LinkedIn with Louise with me, Louise Brogan, and my very lovely guest, Sarah Burgess, who is joining me from... I'm in Wokenham in Berkshire, which is about 35 miles from London. Nice, nice. All right, Sarah, well, welcome to the podcast. Um, I am really interested to chat to you today because we're looking at LinkedIn from a slightly different angle, and that is around careers and career coaching, which is what you are and also how companies can use LinkedIn to attract good talent. We're also going to dip into a bit of university stuff as well, because I know that's an area okay. you work in. Yeah. Um, but before I get ahead of myself, if you would please um, introduce yourself to everybody and tell us, well, we know you're in Berkshire, um, yeah. who you are and what you do. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm Sarah, as you said, I've been a freelance career coach for the last 20 years. Um, and before that, I worked for a financial services company where I looked after the graduate program mm. and also managed the e-learning platform and did some kind of management development training, that kind of thing. Sarah, so I'm really just, interesting... just going to interrupt you straight away. Okay. So when, when I graduated from university and I wanted to get onto one of these graduate programs, were you the person in charge of accepting me? Well, not really to start with, because I was oh, okay. basically asked to go in and troubleshoot the program because we had a massive attrition rate. So for some reason, they thought that I would be a good person to go in and find out why everyone was leaving. And actually, it was a really interesting job. So oh. that's basically what I did. I, my first thing in the role was I set up interviews with all 75 of the graduates had meetings with them all over two weeks it was pretty intense just to find out yeah. why people were leaving why they joined in the first place and basically they'd been over promised so at that point in time everyone wanted to be a internet programmer developer type thing <laughs> and there were three roles but 75 of them wanted to do it so oh. it's a lot about managing expectations, talking to the managers. We also found that quite a lot of the managers were kind of getting their people really liking them. They didn't want to release them. They were meant to be on like a three placement program over the two years. So it was kind of just speaking to everyone really and setting expectations. And, and it, it changed. The expectations changed massively. Everyone was happy to then start rotating um, and then I did start recruiting, but right. we also changed that because initially when I took over the program, they were only recruiting from certain universities with certain oh. grades. But I was like, that's part of the reason why people are leaving, because you're getting all these real high flyers. Yeah. And then they want to go move on. So. So, so yeah. uh, was Dundee one of those universities? What yes. did we took people from <laughs> we, we, we did we did have a yeah we did have someone from Dundee actually yes <laughs> did they have a geography degree like me <laughs> don't think so <laughs> I could at one point I could remember all everyone's degree in universities it was really quite sad but <laughs> no, it's amazing that's amazing it's probably what makes you so good at what you do now so where did you move then from starting out there 20 years ago because I did interrupt you because I was just fine. fascinated that's by fine. this so how did you move on from that? What happened next? So after I managed the graduate program, I took on the e-learning platform, which was like a global e-learning platform. So we Ooh. had about 14,000 people at the company at that point. So I was responsible wow. for getting vendors in, building the platform. So I kind of liaised quite a lot with IT. That's really cool. People about how it was going to get used. And again, that's my whole approach. is I go and talk to people to find out what they want. Because I think there's no point in just developing something that, is never going to be used so kind of got a lot of stakeholder buy-in right from the start and it was really well received um and then Sarah, after, even, Sarah you uh, should have you should have gone into the health service for a little while then because <laughs> that's what I did I worked there for 10 years and I loved it yes um, but part of the big ish, the big issues and you, you know you'd, you'd get a job and you start to learn well actually if we actually went and asked the nurses about this yeah would that not help yeah. us get the right solution exactly I know just talk to people it makes your job yeah. so much easier as well yeah definitely <laughs> yeah. no so it's good um and, and then I was given a very random job which was um create a learning culture so which lots of people were horrified about that what does that mean I said I don't know but it sounds really cool um <laughs> <laughs> again I just went around and talked to people about what they thought it meant and, and what we could do so we implemented yeah. kind of learning resource centers and all of that kind of stuff Brilliant. So it was, it was really interesting. Um, I, I feel really lucky that I had those opportunities at that 
call it that kind of financial services company because it then just gave me so much scope when I did leave yeah. um took redundancy I was in that whole environment where every year it was you need to reapply for your job HR so oh. it was learning development but HR kind of over overriding and mm -hmm. they were cutting kind of down each year and the third time I thought actually I'm gonna take the box for redundancy so that's what I did Set did you get a bit. nice did you get a nice chunky package out of it or not yeah it wasn't bad actually oh, that's <laughs> um, good the the manager at the time he was a brand new manager I felt really bad for him it was his first job was to basically tell people they didn't have a job oh, um, no. but my question was okay when's the date that I'll be leaving because I was just coming up to 30 and you got an extra I don't know four weeks pay or something like oh. that if you 30 yes so he's like oh I don't know so I said well can it be after 29th for me <laughs> I think he was a bit like, are you not shocked? I was like, well, no, because I ticked the box to say that I wanted it. Yeah. It was still a shock because you kind of, even though you tick the box to say you want redundancy, you think, well, why, why didn't they fight for me a bit? Yeah, and I get redundancy at age 30 is, yeah, it's kind of yeah. like, ooh. I, I only really started my career when I was, when did I get my first job? Proper, like proper job? Um, mm. Was in 2000, so I was 26. Right, yeah. So I look yeah. at I look at kids now and it's so different. You go to university and you have to like get loans out and pay for everything. Yeah. So when yeah. they're finished, it's like, well, we need to start work to pay this back. Whereas I had the luxury of, you know, we didn't pay for our fees, obviously. Mm. Um, and yes, we had living expenses and you know, my dad helped me out with um the rent and stuff, and I had part time jobs so that I could still go out and party at the weekends. Yeah, yeah. But then, like, I finished. I worked in a I worked in Tesco Club Card Call Center. Oh, no. For six months, well, it first opened in Dundee, and they opened it in Dundee because they said they liked everyone's accents in Scotland. Of course, I had a Belfast <laughs> accent. Um, but I saved enough to go off traveling for a year. And then I fell down the rabbit hole of just traveling for about yeah. three years. Yeah. Um, but I don't think kids these days get that luxury as much, do they? No, I mean, it, it's, it's funny because I didn't go to university. So I started my career when I was 18 after A-levels. Um, and actually, I didn't even pass my A-levels because when I got offered the job, I was only going to get an extra £500 a year if I passed them. So I was a bit like, oh, well. You didn't need it, yeah. The job. Oh, that's um, funny. So it was kind of ironic when they gave me the job of managing the graduate program when I hadn't been to university, but I ha I have done a degree since whilst I was at work, um, uh -huh. which was what in? So it was in learning and development. Oh, of course. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, quite work related. So yeah, yes. it's really good to do that. Um, That's cool. Yeah. And so how did you move? So when when you took your redundancy, you didn't start yes. your you didn't start this work then because I did, yeah. <laughs> so, oh, but not the LinkedIn work, career coaching. Not the LinkedIn, no. So oh, okay, yes. So I yes. um so there was an outplacement company at, at at the financial service company where I worked. Mm -hmm. um, they offered me some outplacement support, which I hadn't really even heard of before. The consultant I spoke with said to me, have you thought about doing outplacement coaching? So I said, no, I hadn't. He said, oh, I, I don't, sorry, good. I don't know. I don't know what that is. Oh, uh, okay. So it's basically when you get made redundant, they mm. will bring in companies who will give you coaching in CV interview. Uh, so, yeah. And it's called outplacement, I guess. Okay. You'll be outplaced from the company. It's not a particularly nice word. Um, well, it's better than yeah. being kicked out. <laughs> Yes, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, Very so I good. went through the kind of selection process and did some freelance work, basically from then in career coaching for people who had also been made re redundant primarily. Mm -hmm. um, then I was on LinkedIn fairly early, about two thousand and six, I think. I joined, mm. and I, I was using it pretty much from then, showing people how to, and it it was very much an online CV site at that point. Yes. So yes. I've got various screen prints over the years of when it's kind of evolved and things. Um, See, I, I never did that. And I've got, like, I did some video recordings when I first mm -hmm. started teaching people how to use LinkedIn. Um, but the people, like, you have to be super organized to have, like, kept screen grabs of early LinkedIn. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, it's funny, isn't it? I think it's because I was doing presentations to people, so I've still got some of those presentations. You've got those still. Cool, cool. Yeah. So now, if we fast forward to now, Sarah, 
who yeah. who is it you work with do you you know do you work with organizations or individuals both actually so mm-hmm. I um I work with individuals on career coaching so typically mm-hmm. I will do kind of a LinkedIn career coaching hybrid type service so I mm-hmm. go through people's profiles showing them what they need to do optimize their profile for what it is they're looking to do next yeah um if they don't know that's fine as well so kind of talking about the different options finding other people that are doing the work they want to do um and kind of tracking their careers to give people ideas on how they might get there oh uh, nice I kind of send them away with a bit of homework and then we have a second session which is a bit more strategic so looking at mm-hmm. some advice, searching that kind of thing mm-hmm. uh, and then on top of that I would do more traditional career coaching work where talking about you know kind of reflecting over the past looking at people's values what it is they're looking to do how they're going to get uh, they're doing some research um so, so um, I want I want to ask you a couple of questions then okay. um when you're doing the profile optimizing optimizing with these people yeah. what are the top mistakes that you see people making on their profiles that give us the top three mistakes you see Okay, well, I guess the most obvious ones are things like their photos are not visible. So either they won't have a photo because they don't want people to see them for whatever reason, or they'll have their settings set that only first degree connections can set them. Mm. Can see them. So, and that that's tricky, particularly if they've got a name that's quite common, because then you've got no idea who it is you're looking for. Yeah. Uh, also, there was some research done. I can't remember exactly the stats now, but it was quite a high percentage. So it's something like 70% of recruiters won't look at profiles if they haven't got a photo. So wow. you'll be restricting who's going to speculatively find your profile if you don't have a mm-hmm. photo. Yeah. Um, so I'd say that's the first one. Uh, headline. So typically people will have their headline set to their most recent job title and employer. And yeah. that's, that's what LinkedIn has as a default. Um, but that job title might actually bear no resemblance to what that job title is in the marketplace. So, yes, or it might not show the level. So it's something like a HR business partner, as a, as a, for instance, that can be a relatively junior role, or it can be board level, depending on the organization. So you're not giving any kind of uh, information about the scale and the scope of your work, if you've just got that kind of thing in your headline. So I will talk to the people about what it is they do and more importantly yeah. what it is they're looking for and make sure that's replicated somehow in that headline section so we did um podcast listeners uh if you're listening regularly will know that i recently spoke to tina jarvet about mm-hmm. um linkedin and re- recruitment and i think it was tina who said about um that your headline should reflect what linkedin or maybe it was kevin uh, should reflect what LinkedIn calls that job so that you appear in search results was that something you, you would yeah yeah because so there, there there is a list of kind of job titles on LinkedIn yeah. which you can't actually find anywhere but if you for instance go to the open to work section uh-huh. when you go going to put in the job titles you can only pick job titles that exist so ah. you would type in and say hr and it will then give you a list of all of those roles so yeah you need to really look for that nearest equivalent to your role so that recruiters find you because that's the list they search from they only search for the jobs that are in linkedin so you do need to try and find out what that is and what about the open to work badge how do you feel about that do you tell people to use it or not I do tell people to use it so Mm -hmm. there's two options with it so there's one which means you're kind of invisibly searching so you have opened work set up but you have it set to recruiters only so nobody else has set up Mm -hmm. Um, but you can specify up to five job titles five locations whether you're looking for remote or hybrid work um and then basically what that does is it sets it up so that on the recruiter system, when they run their search, yeah. they can put in, say they're looking for a HR business consultant. And then there's a little checkbox, which, which they can check, which says, show me anyone that's open to work. So you would then appear in that list. Ooh. And again, so. Uh, Tony, that's interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah. So it's really useful. So again, lots of, impl- lots of recruiters will tick that box. So if you haven't mm-hmm. got that set up, then you're, you're missing out on being found for that. So obviously you recruiters could... can search the whole of LinkedIn, but if, if they're yes. looking, definitely people that are looking for work, then that's what they would select. But you could, so you're saying we could turn it on, but 
non-recruiters so someone like me wouldn't see that it was you on no no that's so interesting it's really good and then and the other mm. thing to do is so if you work for a big hump company that has linkedin recruiter lots of people were concerned then that the recruitment team within their company would find them but what they do is they they linkedin have something in place that basically says a recruiter can't see anyone from within their own company that's looking for work Ooh. so obviously they say they can't guarantee it blah 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 but yeah. that's the underlying um assumption there that you wouldn't be able to see that that's interesting i wonder then so Let's pick a let's let's just pick Microsoft because they own LinkedIn. Yes. So if you worked at Microsoft and you had put that you were looking, you're open to work, but it's set to recruiters only. Yeah. Um, and you ticked that um, you didn't want Microsoft, your employer, to know that you. Had you don't set even have to tick it. Yeah, you don't even have to tick it. It does that. Okay. Point. It won't let anyone. I suppose the the thing to watch out for is there is that your boss might have hired an external recruitment agency. Yes. And they might see that. Thing. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Mm, that's so interesting. Yeah. Um. Okay. So profile photograph so and headline. Thing. Yeah. And what What will be a third mistake you see people making? Um. So the third mistake I would say is not having anything. I mean, in the experience section is important for recruiters. So when a recruiter mm. search, and they you come up in their result results, they'll see your photo, your headline, and then they'll see your experience section untruncated. So you've got the potential there to have quite a lot of information in that they will see. Yes. Most everyone I work with just has their job title and employer set up in the yeah. experience. They don't have anything else. So you don't need to have your full CV in there. But I always say to people, give enough that shows the kind of the scale and scope of your work so that people can see that. But also you'll get picked up in keyword searches, that, that kind of thing. Do you think if you are on LinkedIn looking for career advancement that's more important then than the about summary I think it probably is yeah mm -hmm. I think the about yeah. section is really important but from if you're looking to be found by recruiters mm -hmm. I think yeah. the experience section is more important because they see that in their view so they have a different system they may well come and look at your profile and then look at the about section um but yeah, yeah. I think this is more I feel like this. Ep I feel like this episode is going to be like a little gold mine for people who are looking to work <laughs> on LinkedIn. <laughs> so going back to open to work. So so the first view is nobody else can see it, but the second yes. view is when you do get the green banner. So yes, you set it so that everyone can see it. You get the green banner that says I'm open to work. I know lots of people hate it because they think it makes them look desperate. I I I, I don't agree. I think if you're looking for work. LinkedIn is the perfect place you're looking for work yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah you're, you're looking for work you want your network to help you so why wouldn't you have it set up yeah uh, what you can also do so you go in and you fill out the same information but at the bottom you click to say you're open to work visible to everybody and it will then prompt you to send a post out to your network so this is really really important to do this because mm -hmm. it will it will give you like a template banner and some words but you can change all of that mm -hmm. um, and then you write your message. And typically, I would say to people, when you're leaving your organization, use this as your leaving message. So, you know, I'm just leaving Microsoft after how many, how many happy years. Um, mm -hmm. This is the kind of work I'm looking for. If anyone wants to meet for a coffee, you know, make it as friendly as you want to and then post that. Because mm -hmm. the, what I've been told, and it does seem to be the case, is that actually that hits the newsfeed of all of your connections. So whereas a normal post only goes mm -hmm. up to what is it five percent of your network yes this one apparently goes into the newsfeed of everyone you're connected to so I have tried it a couple of times on my own the reach does does seem to be massively improved wow so it, it has the hashtag open to work so I would definitely keep that on because some people do search on that hashtag yes that's cool that's really good that's really good tip yeah and lots of people will engage in those posts because uh -huh. by liking it or commenting on it, it's going to push it out further to their network which is really helpful so yeah, I mean, I think that. I I think that I talk about this in my training. I think generally people on LinkedIn are quite positive and they want to help you. And if you're looking exactly. for work, yeah. they want to help you. That's yeah. my that's how I see the platform. Exactly. So that's, yeah. And you put yeah. yourself in the other position, don't you? If someone asked you for help, you would help them. So why wouldn't yeah. they help? Absolutely. Um, and then, then the other thing with open to work is it then does signal to any recruiters you're connected to that you've got that set up. Mm -hmm. um, and I've had some really good chats with Tina and also uh, Tony Nicholson about the recruiter system and how it works 
and and what they've both said to me also is that if you're connected to recruiters what happens is if you make any changes to your profile it will then notify those people in recruiter that you've made changes so it's really important to kind of tweak a picture or you know edit your headline because that recruiter will then get a notification yes, get notified. Know, their list again so that's that's really mm. good um, and also Kevin uh, who you mentioned earlier suggested if you switch it off and switch it back on again that does the same kind of thing so you're kind of then just quite easily getting back in the view of the recruiters by doing that yeah. kind of thing such little little things to do yeah. that make such a huge impact exactly. that's really cool so if, if we switch around Sarah and we think about so I work with a lot of organizations and companies <clears throat> who are trying to hire people they're so trying to yeah. make themselves attractive to people to come and work for them um do you do do you work in that space and what you know what would your advice be for like how a company could use its company page to attract talent yeah so yeah I do work with um companies as well um and, and I have worked with a couple who are looking to recruit people so there's a few things that you can do so um first of all I'd say just make the most of your pages so use the about section to give a really good view of the organization make sure that you're kind of selling yourself make sure you're posting as a company if you can um so that you try and engage with people who do write comments I think that's probably something that doesn't happen that often is mm-hmm. people might comment on a company post but then nobody from the company replies so I would say <laughs> to do that I see it all the time <laughs> yeah I know try to do that um the jobs if you're going to use LinkedIn to post jobs then you can do that I would say try to advertise the salary because most people don't and it's really frustrating Mm. for job seekers you know they might spend hours applying for a job that the salary expectations just don't match so definitely do that Mm -hmm. um maybe have someone named at the company for candidates to talk to that's a really big thing so quite a lot on the job search page now you will see the name of the person that has um that's like the contact person uh, oh, if so got, you mean really yes? Fun. You mean if they're if they're posting a job on the company page, give it you know give as much information as you can and give somebody they can contact to speak to. Yes, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Posted a job on their page and they've given the details and they've given the person to contact. What do they do next? So what what the job seeker can do then is they can if they've got LinkedIn Premium, they will see who that person is that's recruiting for the role, so they can then message that person about the role. Mm-hmm. Something really new that I just saw this morning, actually, that has just rolled out is you can now use AI to help you draft that message. So you oh, click yes, on- I've seen that. Yes. And then it's it basically looks at your profile, looks at the job and send something and write something. And then they recommend that you amend it before you send it, which I would definitely do. Because the yes. one that except for me had lots of exclamation marks all over the place on it, which is a bit <laughs> <bizarre>. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah have a look at that so I mean I think it can be useful for a bit of a, a structure but definitely tailor it a bit more than that then yes. what happens is that sent that goes off to the person that's advertising for the role and ideally then they will respond to you so mm-hmm. I would say for a company that's got this set up try to make sure you do respond to candidates I know it, it's probably frustrating when you get hundreds of people that aren't the right person for the job but yeah um at the same time when you're the person that's applied for it it's really annoying when you don't then get a response well you have to go through it to find the, the person the diamond in the rough is not what they say in the Aladdin yes, movie <laughs> exactly yeah um, um and when when they set up the, jo- the job what the recruiting manager or recruiting person can do is set up to 10 key skills that they want that candidate to have mm-hmm. and what happens then when the candidate looks at it they will get a like a list of those 10 skills and have ticks by the ones that they've got if they haven't got them they can click on the plus button that will then add them to their skills select section so obviously oh. if you've got those skills but then what happens is when you click on apply for the job the recruiter sees what kind of a match you are to that job so how many of the 10 skills you've got so that that's really useful if they don't do it then the ai will generate those 10 skills sometimes not always okay um, sometimes they can be quite random so as a job seeker I would say you know have a look at those skills if there are some that are completely random what you can do is click on the down arrow or so the, the, the thumb down yes. and that reports back to LinkedIn that it's not really a genuine skill oh okay it's quite important so, to do, I think do you think um we mentioned the magic word there AI yeah <laughs> 
Do you think that there is a lot of AI in the recruitment and career coaching and job seeking space at the minute? There seems to be more. So I've um, I've been speaking to a couple of recruiters about this whole idea of getting AI to rewrite your CV next to a job mm-hmm. description. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's definitely possible. Uh, yeah. Do you think? And, do you think, Sarah, that then? So this is where I have not an issue with it because it's not really an area that I work in mm-hmm. at all. But I'm kind of curious about, you know. If, if I had my CV or my resume written based on my skills and experience, and then I see a job description and I think, oh, that doesn't really quite fit. So let's get AI to make my resume fit that job description. Yeah. Are we not are we not just then going into an interview for a job that we'd actually not, that wouldn't suit us? Possibly. Yeah, possibly. That's the thing. I, I, I don't know enough about how it works. I would like yeah. to think what it will do is take... So, so I think what you would do is you would upload the job description and you would upload your CV and you would yeah. say, give me a CV based on this job description as much as possible. So what it did on the the cold message to the recruiter when I tried it earlier is it did pick up some things with my profile. So it said, been a career coach for 20 years, done this thing in LinkedIn because mm-hmm. the job was you needed to be strong in LinkedIn. So it did pick up keywords from my profile. So it didn't make anything up. Yeah. So I think it would pull stuff, but it, who knows on the emphasis, that's the thing. It might pick out the wrong things. I don't is know. This actually, is this actually inside LinkedIn, this AI? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. So it was on the job seeker page. So you basically yeah. went in. Um, so it was a job that was for a local university looking for LinkedIn and other social media stuff. Right. So yeah, click on the button and it drafts something for you. Wow, I've not seen that. That is really yeah. interesting. I only saw it today, so it, I think it is quite new. Yeah, so I sorry, I said I've seen that already. I thought you meant the messaging to recruiters. I've seen that uh, AI generated yeah. messaging. Yeah. So that yeah, so so like as a complete aside, um, what's going on at the minute with I don't know if you're following the news, but OpenAI and Sam Altman and Microsoft. Um, I'm a bit of a news junkie. Um, as long as it's not like war and, and awful stuff, yeah. I, like I, I like, I like reading all this other kind of news. Um, so like, so Sam Altman was the co-founder of OpenAI. Yeah. I got fired fired by his board. I don't even know what day it was. Last week. Yeah. Over the week over the weekend, went into the office with a guest pass. I think Monday night or else yesterday. So this is, as we're recording this, this is all probably like really old hat by the time <laughs> this comes out. Microsoft had offered him a job and anybody from anybody from OpenAI, they said, we'll match your salary, come work for us. So it was almost like they were swallowing up oh, wow. the yeah. OpenAI team. And then we wake up on Wednesday, 22nd of November and Sam Altman has been is back in OpenAI as the CEO, wow. which I guess means, I don't know if those people already signed contracts with Microsoft. It's all moving so fast. But I guess they didn't wow. really want to be swallowed up by Microsoft. But yeah. who knows, by the time this goes out, maybe it will be who knows, an, yeah. an in-house wing of Microsoft. And they'll all have sold all their shares and gone off to live in the Bahamas. Who knows? Yeah, who knows? Uh, it's who kind knows? of fascinating to me. Uh, but is, obviously, yeah. but for listeners... Microsoft owns LinkedIn. Yes. So there, there is no getting away from the fact that they are obviously really going to develop out these AI features yeah. on the platform. It's yeah. kind of fascinating. Yeah. And um, I mean, there, there has been, you can use AI to generate your headline. You can use AI mm-hmm. to generate the about section. It doesn't appear to everyone all the time. It just kind of pops up every now and then like, oh, try this with like a little new logo. Is it not because, do you not have to have premium to get it? No. No, oh, okay. I've, had, I've definitely had clients who haven't had premium. Sort of, um, That's interesting. You know, okay, yeah. right. Mm. I don't um, know, you know, in the job search, it's come up as a premium feature, but on the about section, definitely clients that haven't had premium, it's come up and it's rewritten the about section for them. So I, um, one of the things I said yesterday, so I'm doing a little poll on LinkedIn at the minute about who, people who's using AI, who wants to admit to be using AI? Maybe, yes. I should have, maybe that should have been my question. Um. And I said that I, I've seen it offered on my profile. It's there all the time, but I yeah. haven't used it because I know if you use it, I'm I'm curious, 
if I use it once to see what it's like to make a video for YouTube, for example, yeah. then people who have used it, it says this profile was enhanced by AI. Yes. So I don't want I don't want that to be put on my profile. So I haven't yeah. used it. Yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Maybe I'll test out my husband's profile because he doesn't. Yeah, care. exactly. Yeah. That might be the way to do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um so Sarah, one of the things that I noticed on your profile is that you do some work with universities. So talk to us I a little do. bit about that. Yeah, tell yeah. us about that. Um so I go in and run sessions to kind of groups of students, whether they are, you know, in the business function or in the HR function or marketing, mm-hmm. whatever. Um, and sometimes alumni members. So they'll have kind of events in the evening for alumni people where I will go in and talk about LinkedIn and how to use that to help you to manage, plan, develop your career. Yeah. So again, I'll spend time going through the profile and just showing people how to use some of the advanced search functionality so they can find people that are doing that they want to do talk about things like informational interviews so how to try to arrange to talk to someone about that job that they're doing Mm -hmm. um yeah and just start really understand a bit more about the principles of networking and how incredibly useful linkedin is in that activity um there's just so much on linkedin you can do there's there's an interview function where you can go in and practice your interview skills. It will record you a video. It then gives yeah. you some feedback. So it tells you about the pitch and the tone of your voice. That's really useful. It's such a cool tool. I only, I literally only really found that in the last few months. It's very yeah. cool. Really good. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, so that's what I do. I get the students to have their LinkedIn open so that they can make changes as we're going through. So it's normally really interactive because they'll have kind of questions as we're going along. Yeah. So um, in your in your experience of this, because I have worked, I have done sessions with several universities. Um, now, my my sweet spot is actually going in and working with the, the staff at the universities. I really yeah. enjoy doing that and, and showing yeah. them how they can, you know, attract more graduates and business yes. to their universities. Um, but uh, I have done some sessions with graduating students. Yeah. And it's all you know, I think it's wonderful that you're graduating. So your lecturer has thought, I need you guys all to understand how to use LinkedIn before you go yes, into definitely. the big world. Yeah. But in my experience, most most students don't even really they might have opened a LinkedIn account, but that is it. I, and I think that it goes back to people just think it's a job search tool and mm-hmm. it really isn't. it's such a good resource for information. And that's a lot of what I cover. So I say, you know, yeah. If you're interested in AI, for instance, then use LinkedIn to find people who talk about that. You, so you can yeah. find them experts, but you can also get really up to date thinking. So if you're going for an interview, you could just say, I've just read this. Um, and you're you're getting really good up to date information from people. And hopefully if other people have engaged with those posts. Yeah. Yeah. You're just getting really good up to date information that you can talk about. Yeah, it's it's, it's so powerful. Hopefully. Um, people who are listening I think probably more likely people listening will be actually the staff at the universities yes. as opposed to the students yes um, I have encouraged my niece and nephew to get on LinkedIn <laughs> yeah yeah my, yeah my kids are both on but they you know same for them use it more use it more but uh-huh, they're, they're <laughs> too much fun over here on TikTok <laughs> exactly exactly yeah oh Sarah what a wealth of information you have given us today um so if somebody is listening and they're thinking, well, this is somebody I need to talk to because I'm changing my career or somebody wants you to come and talk to their students, where can people find you? Right, LinkedIn, really. So that, that's where I am all the time. So I spend all day on here. <laughs> and do you work with people outside of the UK as well? I do. Yes. Yeah. Okay, uh, cool. yeah, yeah. I have clients all, all over. Right. So people look for Sarah Burgess. Am I pronouncing your second name you correctly? Are, yes. Okay, yeah. Sarah Burgess over on LinkedIn, and we'll put a link to her um profile down in the show notes as well. Sarah, cool. thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. So much valuable stuff there, especially if you are um looking to advance your career over on LinkedIn. And also it's good to know if you are a company um or working in HR, what people what features are available to people over on LinkedIn as well and to you as someone who's looking for some staff. So I hope you find that useful and all the AI stuff. We had a bit of a laugh because by the time you talk about AI and then you release um, whatever you said about AI, it's probably out of date. (laughs) 
what is definitely not out of date is that LinkedIn are really on board with AI. So it'd be interesting to see where it goes with that in 2024. So thanks so much for listening, guys. If you find this useful, please share it with somebody else. And as if you would like to give me a rating or review over on your favorite podcast player, that would be amazing. And I shall speak to you next week.